What's going on, Salt Strong Nation? Me and Tony are back for another species-specific podcast. You guys enjoyed our podcast on spring redfish so much. We wanted to go ahead and do one on trout as well because all of our anglers that are, you know, from the Carolinas, Virginia, all the way down to Texas, we all have speckled trout in our estuaries, and they're a very, very popular fish to target. So we wanted to go over everything from tackle, spot selection, retrieves, the whole nine today. Uh, I've got Tony here with me, and he fishes in the Mosquito Lagoon area. I'm over in Texas and Aransas Pass, but we both have fished a lot of different areas, you know, ranging from the Carolinas. Tony's been up on the northeast coast of Florida over on the west coast as well. So we're going to be able to provide a broad spectrum of information that's going to apply to really anybody who's targeting speckled trout. So I think we're going to go ahead and start off with the tackle for spring. That's uh, kind of a hot topic right now. What should you be throwing for these fish? So Tony, what have you been seeing working lately over in your area and, you know, some surrounding areas? I know you're checking out the reports in the insider community where you can really see what is being caught on what. So you, you've kind of stayed in tune with what's going on in your area. What are you seeing working best for speckled trout? So over, over my area, you know, Mosquito Lagoon, Indian River, Banana River, a lot of our trout are pushed up pretty shallow. So if you can get on that really early morning topwater bite, it can be a blast. You know, look for the bait fish schools and throw a topwater. And you can use, you know, a popper. You can use like a, a prop bait. But my favorite is going to be the walk the dog type of bait, you know, the head and super spook junior or the Rapala skitter walk. One of those two, pretty much very similar. Uh, as far as color selection goes, if I'm fishing in pretty clean water, uh, some areas are, you know, it's hit or miss in this area right now. Some areas are pretty clean. Some areas are a little bit dirty. We just had a lot of rainfall the past few days. So there's a good chance the water is going to get very dirty with all that runoff. So when it does get dirty, I like to throw a black and chartreuse color. That dark color seems to just have a better silhouette on the surface when those trout are looking up and going to go after it. You know, the sound and the action is one thing, but if you can make it a little bit easier for them to dial in on where it's at, you're more likely to get a strike because a lot of times, you know, you'll see trout strike. Sometimes they'll completely miss the lure. So color can definitely help when it comes to that light color and a dark color. Now, when, you know, after the sun comes up a little bit, I preferably like to go after trout first thing in the morning. It seems a little tougher to get them to bite later on in the day. Sun's higher. They can see a lot of what's going on. Usually when you can see the trout, they can see you. Just like snook, it's really tough to get them to bite when that happens. So I like to go with soft plastic jerk shad. You know, a five-inch Alabama leprechaun or, you know, a five-inch gulp jerk shad in that watermelon sort of red uh, camo color also works uh, well, too. And I have it rigged on a three-aught, one-eighth ounce owner twist lock hook. Again, I'm mainly targeting these fish in about four feet or less in on the flats. You know, grassy areas, even, you know, the sandy areas, they like to push up and uh, warm themselves up when that sun comes up. Now, the only time I won't throw the jerk shad is if I happen to be in an area where there's a lot of puffer fish or there's a lot of pin fish that are tearing up the soft plastic. In that case, I'll switch over to something that has a, you know, a similar darting action, but it won't get torn up by puffer fish. So mirror lure, mirror dean. Speckled trout color works really good. Trout like to eat other trout you know that's why you don't see a lot of small trout hanging out with big trout because they're going to get eaten so that one will do or just a standard you know silver with the green back will get the job done as well another thing about the jerk shed if the tails do get bitten off don't don't take it off you know even a little nub will work really well those trout are more dialed in on the action in my opinion and that's that's something else we're going to talk about too but uh what lures do you do you like what yeah so it's funny we, we've got a very similar selection i'd say there's just very small subtle differences and you know some of the brands i picked anything like that but a lot of times it's just what's ever on the the clearance section in academy or in our salt strong shop so uh, like you said in the mornings i really like to start with top water for trout uh, especially just because right now is when you can get a lot of big spawning trout and they're very aggressive that top water bite in the morning has really been starting to turn on the past couple of weeks and i've had some really good success 
throwing, you know, your medium sized top waters. I don't have any of my super spooks um, or my Rapala skitter walk eights, which are the smaller version of the skitter walks. Uh, so I do have my larger top waters here. I will throw these if I know there's larger trout in the area, but if I'm just trying to get on the most numbers, super spook junior and the skitter walk eight have been my best producers just because there's a lot of smaller bait around here in Texas. There's a small shad hatch that's going on. Uh, and a lot of those fish are in your two to three inch size, not too too big of bait fish. Uh, there are still some larger pogies around, so you can still get away with throwing the larger top waters as well. But most of the fish seem to be dialed in on your, your small to medium sized bait fish. So I like to throw something that's a little bit larger than that hatch. Um, so the, you know, Yozuri inshore pencil, uh, the 3D inshore pencil works really well for me, um, as well as the Rapala, you know, skitter walk. Uh, these colors that I'm choosing usually are going to have those silver sides, that black back in the water that's, you know, clear to moderate clear. So I should be able to see the bottom, see potholes, things like that, if I'm going to be throwing this color, uh, because, you know, I feel like trout are visual predators. It's very important that you give them a silhouette that they can see and attack. It's not like redfish that a lot of times go off of feel, I feel like uh, when there's vibration in the water, they'll dial in on that and they'll just, you know, go and hammer it. They can't really see very well because their eyes are on the sides of their head. Trout are a little bit different. Their eyes are on the top of their head. So they're constantly looking up. They're looking for the bait that they're going to be attacking. So I feel like matching your color on your top water. And a lot of people say that color doesn't matter too much on a top water. You're right. It doesn't. The patterns, things like that really don't. But the silhouette that your top water gives off is very important. And the colors that are on that top water are going to affect the silhouette. So a silver uh, side with a black back is going to create a little bit, you know, more subtle of a silhouette in clear water. And you don't want to have, you know, the most contrasting colors out there. Uh, so what's really interesting, though, is if you're fishing really dirty water, that silhouette is going to be too subtle. It's not going to show up as that light shining through uh, the darker waters, and it's going to kind of create uh, light, I, I forget the word is called, but uh, as light kind of penetrates the surface of dirty water, the ability to actually see things goes, you know, away because there's so much sediment, it's blocking light that continues through. So trout that are kind of holding closer to the bottom are not going to see all the way to the top unless there's something that's really contrasting. So in dirty water, I'm going to throw one of these skitter walks. I really like this color, the chartreuse head with the black body. It just gives off a better, a better silhouette. It's very contrasting. Uh, the light that's bouncing off of it just makes it really easy for those trout to pick up on what's going on. And I'll fish this over oyster bars, over potholes, uh, and trout, you know, usually early in the morning are hanging in those areas looking to get an easy meal. So in clear water, I'm throwing your, you know, natural color, again, with the, the speckles on it. Uh, trout are very cannibalistic, uh, and I, I tend to like patterns, even on my neurodines, as I'm going to talk about here in a second, have that speckled, uh, that, that speckled trout pattern. Just seems to work really well. Um, but yeah, natural colors in clearer water for my top waters and really contrasting colors in the dirtier water. Now, as we start kind of getting later on into the day, the sun starts rising and those fish can see a little bit better. I find that they don't like hitting top water as much because again, they're visual predators. If they're having to sit up top and look at the sun, uh, it's gonna be hard for them to strike their bait. So they start hunting subsurface, I find. And, and you know, it really depends on what the weather has been doing, what I'm gonna present for my subsurface presentation. Uh, again, a lot of times I'm gonna be going with bait fish patterns in the spring because there is a, a good hatch of bait fish going on right now. Uh, but if we've had kind of a, a warming trend where those fish are active, their metabolism is is going. I know that they're chasing bait around. I'm going to typically go with a paddle tail uh, and I'm going to be throwing this over, you know, large potholes, um, you know, expansive grass flats where I can kind of see that trout would be holding in a pothole that's kind of off of a barrier island, you know, where, where current's going to be moving around. Uh, so I, I'm looking for areas of high current. I'm not generally fishing in the dead middle of a flat where I know that there's, you know, not too much current flow. Typically, I'm sticking close to the edges of these flats right now. So you, if you have a large expansive flat that's bordered by intercoastal channels, you know, maybe there's some small islands that are kind of close by. I'm going to be throwing these paddle tails, you know, in those areas because there's good current flow. I know that that tail is going to kick really well. Uh, and, and generally, I can find a lot of fish kind of hanging around in those potholes. Now, if we have had a cold front and, you know, there's some deeper holes in the middle of a flat where there's very little 
current flow, I'm going to go ahead and move over there and I'm going to be throwing those Mirrodines, those slow sinking twitch baits, uh, the shadow wrap. I believe this is the, the Rapala shadow wrap or the X wrap. I can't remember exactly which one, uh, but slow sinking twitch baits, you know, if they're on larger bait fish, it seems like I'm going to go with this. Uh, if it's really small bait fish, I'll go with the Mirrodine. Uh, and you know, what's still been working a little bit, but I'm starting to kind of see it tail off is these corkies. Uh, these are fantastic when there are large bait fish around, uh, especially just because they've got a fantastic action to them. Um, and you can really adjust them for how deep you want to work that bait. That, that's really the biggest thing for me is finding out, you know, what depth they're feeding at, what their activity level is in relation to the weather uh, and how I need to present that bait. You know, if it's been warming, I'm going to be using faster presentations like paddle tails. Uh, and if it's been a little bit colder, I know those fish are going to move to areas with lower current. Um, and, but, but I'm going to go ahead and throw those kind of slow sinking twitch baits. Things that are going to have some action to them, but allow a little bit more time for those trout to come up and get in that strike zone. Cool. So just to sort of simplify things, if you're getting ready for a trip in the springtime, going after trout, you had three rods rigged up, what three lures would you have rigged up ready to go? Oh man, I would probably, <laughs> it's tough because I, I love playing around with colors and different size profiles for trout to figure out how I can get on the biggest ones. But if it was tournament day, you had to catch two trout first thing in the morning. Goodness. What would you, what would you have rigged up? Oh, if it was tournament day, I'd definitely be throwing a, a top water, big top water, you know, like a Rapala skitter walk. Again, I'm going to, I'm going to judge what color I'm going to throw based on the, the, the dirty or clear water. And then I'm going to have a paddle tail rigged up four inch, you know, slam shady. It works in both clear and dirty water. I know that color is going to work. Um, I can fish it fast and slow. Uh, and then as kind of my, my wild card, I think I'm going to go ahead and have a slow sinking twitch bait like a Mirrodon. Um, you know, one of those MR-17s. Uh, I like the sea eyes patterns, um, but I also like those, uh, those speckled trout patterns. It'd be one of those two, something that looks like a small bait fish or a very small trout. Uh, those would be the three that I've got rigged up, uh, just depending on, you know, what's going on. I'd be able to switch between all three of those and really get on some good fish. Cool. Yeah, I'd, I'd agree there. I'd have the top water rigged up. I'd have one one of the mirror lure, mirror deans rigged up. And also the only difference is I would go with the jerk shad instead of the paddle tail. I don't know what it is. I don't really catch too many trout on paddle tails on the east coast of Florida, but on the west coast of Florida, they seem to like paddle tails a lot more. I don't I don't know if it's a you know a forage thing, if they they go more after bait fish over on the West Coast, and they don't have as much shrimp as we do on the East Coast. So a darting action tends to get them a little bit more fired up. So curious to see if anybody has any any thoughts on that. So definitely leave some comments down below. Paddle tails versus uh, jerk shads when it comes to trout. Yeah, I'd be interested to see it. Yeah, I'd like to see some comments on what people catch the most trout on jerk shads or paddles. I, and again, I, I do believe it is very regional specific. You know, in the area that you're fishing in Mos Mosquito Lagoon, it doesn't seem like there's a ton of current flow unless you've got really windy days, which I'm sure then you would be throwing a paddle tail. But, you know, on most of your days that you're fishing, you know, it's, it's generally calmer water, I would say, from the reports that I've seen from you. Um, and feel free to comment on that. But I, I feel like on calmer days, I am going to throw jerk shads for those trout. And I've had really, really good days on super calm, uh, you know, slick water. I'm throwing those jerk shads in those potholes. It seems like every pothole I can find that's really isolated in a flat, two twitches, and it's like, thump, they're right there. Um, do you feel like you're throwing paddle tails or jerk shads more just because of the current flow? Uh, I think I'm throwing, throwing jerk shads more. Like if I'm trolling, like sometimes I'll go from spot to spot and I'll throw a paddle tail on and just throw it behind the kayak, you know, like 50 <laughs> yards or so. And I'll pick up like a small trout here or there, but the jerk shad, like if I'm working an area, it just seems to get more strikes for some reason could be, you know, again, just because of the, the main forage over here right now, because we don't have too much grass, you know, we have a lot of shrimp in the muddy backwater areas. Um, finger mullet haven't really showed up yet it's more of the larger mullet just because again there's there's no grass so yeah i'm curious to see what what other thoughts people have about that based yeah. on you know the type of area 
Yeah, for, forage is definitely a very important part of it. You know, from what I understand here in, uh, in Texas, there's a really good migration of, of Gulf shrimp uh, that occurs a little bit later on in the season. And it seems like fish get super dialed into shrimp. So I'm sure my profiles will be adjusting a little bit further on. But right now, there's a really good, good hatch of bait fish. I know when I was in the Carolinas this time of year, it was like, man, the mullet are pouring in. You know, there's, there's so many different bait fish that are starting to flood those marsh creeks. It seemed like you could go to any point, you know, on off those main creek sub channels uh, and, and just really absolutely hammer trout with paddle tails, you know, that three to four inch size. Um, so yeah, that's probably a pretty good point there. I would say the forage is, is definitely a, a, an important part of your tackle selection. Uh, don't be obviously throwing giant paddle tails right now um, because there's not a whole lot of big mullet. Um, but, you know, it, it, and like Tony said, in, your, in his area, it seems like it just, you really got to pair it with the forage that's there. And I think that's a good segue into the retrieves now because, you know, you've got your tackle selected, but with trout, again, being visual predators, you have to present that lure in, you know, the best possible way at the right depth, the right time uh, to, to really get the most success with fish. So what are you using as your kind of go-to retrieve right now? And where are you finding fish? At, like what depths are you finding these fish right now? So the more erratic retrieve tends to work better for trout. You know, redfish, I like to keep it low and slow, keep it on the bottom just because of how redfish feed. They're usually feeding off the bottom, scavenging. They will, you know, ambush their prey, but they're not as much of an ambush predator as trout are. And trout seem to also have that sort of that uh, reaction strikes. You know, if something darts past their head, they go after it. You know, they've, they've got like no fear. I've sight casted some trout before where I've dropped it almost right on their head and twitched it really hard and they they hit it really quick so you know that more erratic retrieve when i'm using top waters go ahead and start with that my go-to retrieve when i start using top waters first thing in the morning is just a steady you know twitch constant twitch constant reel if i'm not getting any strikes i'll do a little bit more of an aggressive you know like a one two let it pause one two let it pause usually on that pause that's when they're going to strike and when they do strike don't try to set the hook. You know, you want to feel the weight of that fish on the lure before, you know, on your line before you go to set that hook. Big mistake people make, they start twitching the lure and it's like as soon as they see the water sp uh, splash, they yank back on the rod. Now the lure is 20 feet away from that fish. So definitely when you're working top water, make sure you, you wait till you feel the weight of that fish. And another thing I like to do with top water is that's why I like to have you know, a jerk shad or a soft plastic rigged up with trout, sometimes you'll see them strike and strike and strike and they just won't connect to the top water. When that happens, I'll either let the top water sit there in the water, then I'll switch over to a rod that has a soft plastic on it and I'll throw it right where that top water's at and that trout will usually pick it up. Or you can reel it in really quick, reel up that top water, throw a soft plastic, follow it up with a soft plastic if you're missing a lot of strikes on top water. Now, as far as the jerk shad, you know, like I said, I'm doing, you know, quick erratic retrieve. Um, I am letting it sink all the way to the bottom. And then I'm doing either a one, two or a one, two, three with a brief pause. And again, usually on that pause, that's when those trout are striking. And it's very similar also with the mirror lure, the mirror dean. Couple quick twitches, let it pause. And the nice thing about this is it suspends in the water column. So when you do pause it, it sort of just sits there like a bait fish that, you know, darted off and then just all of a sudden stopped. And the trout take advantage of that. When they do stop, that's an easy meal right there. So yeah, erratic, keeping it, you know, close to the bottom, but more, you know, mid surface when using those uh, subsurface baits and top waters, you really have to play around with the presentation with that dial in on what those trout respond to best. Yeah, I would 100% agree. You know, with my top waters, my retrieves are basically just a straight walk the dog. Um, if I find that I'm not getting uh, strikes in, you know, if I go to three spots that I really feel like I should have gotten some top water strikes, you know, maybe I'm fishing a point over some potholes or, you know, just a, a creek mouth, something like that. And I've hit three of those, no strikes. I'm going to start mixing some pauses into my, my, my retrieve. So, you know, maybe I'll stop halfway. And if I, for some reason, get a pop or I see a little swirl, then I'm going to start breaking it down to I'll stop three times throughout the retrieve. 
I, I generally try to make it so that I, I'm working around what the fish are telling me they want. And, and with top water, with trout, a lot of times, like you said, you'll see them come up and they'll swipe at it. They don't slurp it down like a redfish. Uh, those two front teeth that they have, those they're using those to wound most times. Uh, unless it's, yeah, I find that at least looking at the underwater footage that Luke got on those bigger trout, most of the larger ones just come and suck, suck it down. I mean, it's crazy. But with top water, a lot of time, I mean, I'm hooked fish in the side of the face because I can see them hit it. They're coming up and they're taking a swipe at it. It seems like to wound it. So what I do when I have a, a trout that comes up and strikes it, um, I'll, I'll give two really quick twitches give it a quick pause and then bam, 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 bam. I'm working it really fast again to get the attention of that trout if it doesn't come up and hit it. And you'll find that those trout will hit it all the way back to the boat. They will continue to follow a lure, but you gotta keep working it. And I'll give a very, very short pause after two twitches uh, just to kind of simulate something that has been wounded. Uh, and then I'm gonna continue to pick it up again. And I've had, hit, I've had trout hit on the pause. I've had them hit on those two hard twitches. And I've also had them hit as I continue to work it back faster, uh, back to the boat. So it just, really depends on what the fish want again just a continuous walk the dog with those you know the prop baits I'm going to roll them slow uh, and then give those pauses as well with my paddle tails as you said I find a lot of fish hit on that drop so what I'm doing is I'm you know having a very constant reel uh, and the speed of my reel is going to be dependent on where I'm finding fish so if you know it has been you know some colder days like we've had in spring you know a frontal blow through I find those fish hold deeper they're holding at the very bottom of those potholes um, they're not on top of the grass they're they're sitting there and they're in the you know best thermocline that they can find in that area so what I'm going to do is reel constantly really slow and that's when I generally give my twitches so that they have a good you know vertical time frame to hit that bait as it's dropping so i'm slow rolling slow rolling and i'm gonna give two twitches up i don't give them to the side because it's going to keep that bait down but i'll give two twitches up which is going to generally get the attention of any trout that are around those potholes they're going to see that bait falling they've got a lot of time to swim over and suck it down uh, and most of the times i'll get that hit on that drop so you have to wait two and three seconds to get that bait to the bottom and i like using the lightest possible jig head or weighted hook that I can to get close to the bottom, but so that it also provides the most suspension as that bait's dropping, because that drop is really what gets their attention. You're just kind of retrieving to cover ground. The, the twitching and the pausing I find, especially with you know the paddle tails or the jerk shads, that's really what triggers the bite itself but you can't cover as much ground if all you're doing is twitching and pausing. Um, so that's why I prefer the paddle tail over the jerk shad. Again, I'm covering larger flats. Um, but you know, I, I find that if the trout are really, really slow um, and I know where they are, I'm gonna throw that Miradine or that Paul Brown Corky, uh, some kind of suspending twitch bait. If I know where they are and the bite is really tough and it's really slow, they're very lethargic because then I can really get surgical on those zones. So. You know, if I'm working a patch of potholes that is, you know, at the entrance of a flat, uh, it's an incoming tide, there's a lot of bait that's moving in, those fish are, are there to feed, but they're not very active because of the temperature. Maybe it's not the right time in the tide, uh, you know, maybe it's just starting to fire up on incoming. There's a lot of factors that can, you know, make a bite slow. And you really have to work for those bites by putting your bait number one in the right spots on top of those potholes and giving that retrieve, you know, whether it's slower, faster, more twitches, less twitches and a longer sink, you really got to play around with your retrieve. I'm usually switching up what I'm doing in terms of, you know, the speed or how many twitches, things like that every three or four casts until I find out what those fish want. You know, I, I need to make sure that I'm putting it in the right spots first. Uh, but then I'm going to play around the, with the retrieve to figure out, you know, what those fish want, because what's really cool about trout and probably why I love them so much as a fish to target is once one of them tells you what they want, you know what the rest of them are dialed in on. They're such an easy fish to pattern in. Um, you know, there's not going to be loners that want certain things versus the other parts of the school. Uh, it's, it's with redfish. I see that happen sometimes. Uh, you know, one school may be dialed in on shrimp. The other might be dialed in on bait fish. It seems like trout. I mean, and I, I'd like to hear your thoughts on this, Tony. They get dialed in on one specific retrieve or one specific pattern of bait, and then you can nail all of them on that. Yeah, I definitely agree with that. Like, I'll, I'll start throwing a jerk shad, and I'll, I'll be catching trout, you know, one after another, and then I'll switch to, like, a paddle tail or like a shrimp imitation, like a, an artificial shrimp and I won't get any more strikes or I'll switch to the mirror lure and I won't get any strikes. So I'll switch back to the, the jerk shad and it'll, it'll keep producing. So 
definitely dial in what works and stick with that. Sometimes you can experiment, you know, when I get into an area with a lot of fish and I notice they're hitting, you know, constantly, if I have a new lure I want to try out, I'll try it out just to see if it works. But for the most part, I'm going to stick to that lure that, that constantly works. And then um, I wanted to touch on too, you talked about it a little bit when you're talking about top water, but retrieving the lure all the way back to you, you know, all the way up to your kayak, all the way up to your boat, all the way up to your feet. If you saw the video that Luke put out, those trout, they stalk their food, you know, especially in the grass, they'll swim in the grass, they'll stalk that, you know, whatever lure you're through, uh, throwing on the bottom. And then when they find the right moment to strike, they're going to strike. So if you think about it, as your lure is coming up to you, you know, your boat or your kayak, or, you know, whatever, if you're on land, they think that bait is going to somewhere to hide because they, they see that structure and it's going towards your boat, going towards your kayak. And I've had so many trout hit right at the last moment before I'm about to bring that lure up out of the water. Cause they think that lure or what they think is food is going somewhere to hide. So that's gotta be one of the biggest mistakes I see a lot of people make is they'll make a cast and then they'll reel it in, you know, retrieve it maybe 20 feet or so on a 90 to hundred foot cast. And then the rest of the way, they just reel it in really fast and make another cast because they're in a hurry. Work that lure all the way back to you. doesn't matter if it's top water, subsurface, fish in the bottom. Definitely uh, definitely keep that in mind. I'm sure you can vouch for that as well. Oh, 100%. It's, it's crazy how many trout I have hit at the boat. And I mean, like the boat or the, you know, the, sk- uh, the kayak, you know, they're not, it seems like when they get dialed in on something, again, these are visual predators they're focused on that bait. It seems like you can get within two, three feet of your kayak or your boat and they'll hit a top water. They'll hit a subsurface paddle tail. Even with something large like a boat or a kayak around, they're there, they're taking swipes at it. I've had fish, you know, I've, I've put the rod down and the bait's hanging in the water and I've had fish come up and whack it as I'm, you know, messing with my phone or something uh, and, and the bait's not even moving, but they've followed it all the way back and I've just left it there and, you know, it's crazy these fish absolutely will stalk. And if you guys have not seen that underwater footage, uh, Luke had, had rigged up a camera with the Slam Shady. It was really insightful to see how some of these larger trout stalk bait, uh, how they kind of cut angles on it, things like that. And you'll see the exact stuff that we're talking about, you know, especially with the drop, that constant retrieve that Luke was doing, you'd see all those fish when he would give a small pause in his retrieve. So he'd be reeling, 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 and then he'd just stop reeling. No twitches, no nothing. And that bait would start to drop. That was when all those trout came up and sucked it down. So you really, really can learn a lot from footage like that, but also be cognizant as you're retrieving and you're seeing, you know, what fish are reacting to. Try to be constantly thinking about what you're doing. That way, when that fish hits, you can do that exact same thing again. I see a lot of people, you know, they're talking, they're on their phone or, you know, uh, whatever, as they're, they're, you know, messing around with their baits. And they don't pay attention to what just worked. And then now they're like, oh man, I don't know exactly how to get back on these fish. Or there's like, I caught one. It's like with trout, you should, when you get one, you should be able to catch several because a lot of times they're not hanging around alone unless it's a really, really large fish. You know, those are the loners. But when you're getting on those 14 to, you know, 18, 19 inch trout, generally they're, they're in larger schools and you can catch multiple fish in one single area. So just, you know, be quiet, anchor down, and continue using what just worked for you. Yeah, and something else that relates to that is, you know, keeping in mind, this leads to the next part we're going to talk about, which is, you know, spots. You know, keep in mind, you know, take into account where you caught that fish. You know, if was it 20 feet off the shoreline? Was it, you know, 100 yards off the shoreline? Was it pushed up close to the shoreline? Was it a pothole? You know, we do the same thing. You know, we make a cast, we hook it to a fish, and we go... We get all excited about it and then we don't realize, you know, all right, where was that fish? Did I just retrieve that lure over a pothole and that fish was sitting in the pothole or was it on the edge of the grass? You really have to take into consideration those things as well. So you dial in that pattern and you can duplicate that on your next cast. Yeah, no, it's it's extremely helpful. Um, but yeah, that does provide a good segue into spots. So this is this is the the final piece. You know, you you know what tackle you need to be using. You know what retrieves you need to be using. 
where are you going to employ this tackle? So we're going to cover, you know, open grass flats. We're going to cover, you know, the areas like Mosquito Lagoon. We're going to cover areas in the Carolinas, you know, all the different types of estuaries that you need to be targeting these fish in. So I'll go ahead and let Tony take it off. Where are you finding the types of spots that are producing trout right now this time of year? So if you're looking for a spot on the map, you're going to want to be looking for grass flats. I know my area, we're having issues with grass right now. They're more, you know, sand flats and mud flats right now, but areas that you used to see grass, those fish will still be in those areas because the bait's still going to be in those areas. They're just accustomed to being in those locations. So if they're not, you know, in the areas where the grass was, they may be pushed up closer to the shoreline or they may be pushed out towards the edge of that flat where there's a depth change. So that's what I'm looking for on the map. You know, I'm looking for shorelines with structure. And then I'm also looking for flats that are close to those shorelines that have, you know, a good depth change. Now, once I'm out on the water, finding bait fish is key. Springtime, that's when the bait fish start showing up more. They're becoming more abundant. And when you start seeing schools of bait fish, I want to dial in on that spot. So, you know, like the 90-10 rule, you could be fishing, you know, uh, let's say quarter mile stretch of shoreline, but there's only bait right outside of a small little creek that's emptying out from that shoreline. That's where those fish are going to be concentrated because there's a bait there, there's structure, there's going to be, uh, you know, food there. So those predators are going to be nearby. Now also take into, into account what the bait fish are doing. If you see that the bait, bait fish are, you know, packed up pretty tightly in schools, or are they just sort of swimming around freely not looking too scared of anything. I want to take that into account because the bait fish that are balled up really tight, they're trying to basically stay safe from predators because that's when they're ball up really tight. Also, if they're jumping, if you see bait fish just kind of jumping in the air, you know, not looking too skittish, there's probably not predators around. If you see bait fish, you know, they sort of, I call it almost like a wave. You see like a wave of bait fish jumping out of the water at once, that means something's going after them. So, you know, really assess what's going on in the area itself. Also birds, if you see birds in an area, doesn't matter if they're waiting, if they're diving, if they're just floating on the surface of the water, they may have just finished eating. If that's the case, if they just finished eating, there's gonna be scraps of bait fish in the water. Trout will take advantage of that as well. They I've, I've had trout hit cut bait before, so they will scavenge if they need to, especially in my area where bait is scarce, whatever food they can find, they're going to go after. Yeah, I, I completely agree with you. The three Bs, you know, once you're on the water is, uh, is extremely important. Now, if someone was looking at satellite maps, where would you say you need to really dial in off the water to find these trout? When you're looking, you know, doing your research the night before. Yeah. Yeah. So just like I said, you know, find those shorelines that have a flat that runs along that shoreline because I'm usually finding these fish in four feet of water or less. And if water levels are up, uh, you know, in my area, we don't really have tidal flow. So it's more like we either have, you know, a constant high tide if water levels are up or we have, you know, an extended low tide when water levels are down depending on the amount of rainfall we have. So if the water is pushed up, I find a lot of trout closer to the mangroves, uh, closer to the shoreline points, things like that. If you find a stretch of shoreline that's pretty bare, you know, not a lot of features to it, look for something unique on that shoreline. If you see a point that sticks out, if you see a creek that dumps out, you know, off that shoreline, those are the things they're gonna be looking for. Awesome, yeah. Yeah, I would say that, you know, in my area, it's very, very similar. You know, you've got an expansive grass flat. That's the first thing I'm going to look for. Trout seem to really dial in on, on, on flats uh, that have a lot of grass on them. If you look at their bodies, they're, they're pretty much situated here. I'll grab one of these uh, speckled trout patterns right here on my mirror dime. All those spots that are on the backs uh, of trout that you see that are like that, that's to help them disguise themselves when they're actually in the grass itself. So again, they're sitting in these potholes, their backs stick up, they have a dark olive back with those spots that kind of help break up their profile to bait fish that are swimming over them so that they don't see them and then they just kind of pounce up out of the grass and grab that bait. So grass 
class is one of the first things that I look for if I'm in an estuary that has it. In the Carolinas, there's not a whole lot of grass. A lot of times what you've got is mud and oyster shell and sand. And in those areas, what I'm looking for is generally clearer water, uh, you know, closer to inlets and passes because again, these fish are visual predators. I don't find them too much in the super muddy back creeks unless those areas have like really good current flow and they are again closer to inlets and passes that are going to have good flow of bait. There are trout that will hang out in those muddy zones and a lot of times you're going to find them where there's good high current that's going to generally keep the water a little bit clearer. If it's really still and brown, I don't generally catch a lot of trout there. That's a good redfish spot, maybe even flounder, but in those back creeks, or those marsh environments. I find them generally at the entrances to marshes and kind of open expansive areas uh, that, that are surrounded by that standing grass. Uh, I find them at entrances to those zones where there's gonna be good current flow uh, that they're, they're not gonna have to kind of go around and hunt. They can put themselves in a inflow outflow point where the bait's gonna be pushed in by the current and pulled out by the outgoing tide. So if you're in a marsh environment, look for entry and exit points to flats, entry and exit points to creeks, things like that, high current areas. I usually don't find them just sitting along shorelines in the, the actual grass, uh, the grass itself. Um, but I would say that, you know, on the flip side of that here in Texas, where you've got the open expansive grass flats in a lot of areas, you will find them in the middle of flats and you will find them hanging on shorelines. They behave differently in different estuaries, but I'm still targeting again, entry and exit points. I just do it slightly different. So in the marsh environments, they seem to hang really tight to the points. Um, or those kind of those cuts where you know you've got a channel that's been moved by current. So as that current flows into a marsh uh, where it flows out, it displaces sediment. You've got a little bit of a cut uh, that occurs. So you know it'll drop off from the grass, the standing grass on that point from you know maybe a foot, and it'll drop down to like five feet. And they're hanging right on that depth change as that current kind of flows onto the flat and they're ambushing bait as it goes around that depth change or goes over it. Uh, so that's where I find fish in those marsh environments. And to, to use that same concept, as you look at these open grass flats uh, that are here, you know, an example in Texas, uh, what you've got is a lot of barrier islands that are on the edges of these flats. And what happens is on incoming or outgoing tides, uh, generally when there's like a max current flow period is when I like to target trout because they are feeding with the current. You know, they're streamlined, they're designed to feed uh, as an ambush predator as bait is kind of brought to them. So I'm looking for breaks in these barrier islands where current's gonna push bait through or pull bait out. Any kind of drain that occurs on an outgoing tide where you can see that, you know, there's good current flow off of a flat. So you can generally see if you're looking at a satellite image where water is going to flow onto a flat and where it flows off. If you've got really large depth changes that are on the edges, you can see, you know, where the water goes from, you can see super clear the potholes, things like that, and it drops down into a really dark blue. That's a depth change where water is going to flow in and out. That's entry and exit point. And you're going to find that trout relate very closely to those areas in the potholes surrounding that uh, kind of flat, or maybe even in that dark blue hole itself that exits the flat you know, on a low tide where they don't have a lot of water to hunt up on the flat itself. I do find that in the estuaries here, trout will prefer to move up shallower if the water levels allow it, just because it's easier for them to hunt in shallow water. If there's, you know, a foot and a half of water for a larger trout to be able to ambush bait against the surface of the water, they're going to go ahead and take that opportunity. But, you know, if it's just a couple of inches and they can't get up in it, you know, they're obviously not going to be there and they're going to drop down into those lower levels. But if they can, they'll push into water that's, you know, two or three feet is, is generally where I find most of my schooling trout, my most numbers. Uh, they'll push into two or three feet of water where they can kind of pin bait up against the surface uh, if it swims over them, that there's not a lot of area for that bait to go. So they'll move as shallow as they can comfortably, uh, but I find them generally relating to those areas that have good current flow, that have potholes where there's points, any kind of structure that allows them to ambush bait a little bit better or is gonna create kind of a funnel of bait with an incoming or outgoing tide. All of those things really factor into what makes a good spot for trout. Um, and, and again, when you're on the water, you know, being able to quickly assess these areas is important. So I don't generally find a lot of boils with trout. Um, you know, they're, they're kind of a smaller fish. So you might see a little bit of a plume if you spook one off, but it's not like redfish where, it, you know, it looks like a, a bomb went off underwater with those boils. Uh, but, you know, bait, super, super important. A lot of times you will see bait jumping around uh, as we get later on to the into the season, you know, big mullet schools are 
really a key indicator of drought activity. Uh, and, and a lot of times you will see those mullet, you know, they will be jumping around. And something I want to kind of clarify real fast, we get this question a lot. If you just see a single mullet jumping around, you know, multiple times, trying to act like it's a dolphin, that doesn't necessarily mean that a predator is chasing it. It just tells you that there are mullet there, which is a good sign, but it doesn't tell you that there are fish feeding. Now, if you see mullet quickly skipping along the surface, that's a different story. And, and you know, the difference between this is, is they're only jumping, you know, maybe an inch or two out of the water. It's because they're dodging that trout that just came up to take a swipe at them as they were kind of working along the surface, like you see when they hit their top water. Uh, but if you're seeing them jump two, three feet out of the water and they're doing it multiple times, that's not a predator chasing them. And like Tony mentioned earlier with the small bait fish that are almost like showering, you'll see a, a big group of them all jump out of the water at once. Not a single fish, you'll see a big group like six, seven, eight, nine, ten of them jumping all out of the water at once. It's because a trout just came up and took a swipe at that school or a redfish or some predator. But generally in those areas, it, it is going to be a trout. And that is, again, presence of bait fish. And obviously birds, you know, wading birds are, are one of my favorite things to see. Seagulls that are diving on bait are really good as well. Uh, all those, you know, types of birds. I generally don't get too excited about pelicans. Um, you know, they'll come and they'll eat some larger fish. So uh, they don't generally indicate to me the presence of, you know, trout or predator fish. Uh, generally, it's those white egrets, large herons, uh, wading birds of that nature and seagulls. Those are going to be the birds that indicate to me, you know, that there's bait around. Um, so those are kind of all the things that I'm looking for off the water and on the water uh, that are going to contribute to, you know, where my best trout spots are in the spring. Just areas where there's going to be really good current flow of bait um, and there's areas that they can ambush them. Because here in the springtime, you know, these trout are dialed in on one thing and that's feeding. They're not worried about, you know, targeting area or they're not, they're not worried about holding in areas where they can stay warm or they can, you know, get some colder water because we haven't gotten into the extreme temperatures of summer and we're out of the really cold throws of, of winter. So, you know, they're just focused on feeding right now. So maximizing the amount of bait that's going to be kind of in their zone is, is what they're kind of most focused on. So that's what my main focus is when I'm picking spots for trout. Um, you know, do, do you see those similar trends occurring in your area, Tony? Yeah, I do. And, um, one thing I want to touch on too, you were talking about birds. One bird that I do like to see flying overhead circling is going to be an osprey. Mm. Because whenever I see an osprey with a fish in its claws flying away, it's got a trout. <laughs> so they're, they're dialed in, in the trout, uh, on the trout as well, especially up in the shallows. If you see them circling out sort of in deeper water, they're probably going after mullet. But if you see them circling, you know, the shoreline, looking for something on the shoreline, they're most likely looking for trout, not so much redfish. Redfish are just tough for them to grab. Number one, they're heavy. And also, you know, the scales, it just makes it hard to grab redfish. Trout, nice and soft, meaty, easy for those osprey to pick off. So if you do see those birds circling an area, go check it out. Oh, yeah. And a lot of times I'll use birds as kind of my... Uh, I'll use them as an extended fish finder. So I know whether to go look at an area or not. If you see a bird fly over a shoreline and their head doesn't turn, you know, if they're just making a straight D line, they didn't see anything that caught their attention, which is including large predator fish. A lot of times they will look at a fish, you know, you'll see them turn their head. If I see one going down a shoreline, I'm about to go fish. I'll see what they're doing. If they, you know, if they turn their head and they look at something and they circle back, they may or may not dive, uh, because, but they saw something that caught their attention. And generally that is going to be a larger fish uh, that, you know, especially if they don't dive and I see them look at something and they circle back, I'm like, oh man, I got to go over there and check that out because they probably saw, you know, a large redfish or a large trout because uh, it caught their attention, but then they realized it's not food for them because it's too big and they continued on. Uh, with ospreys, that is a little bit different. They will dive on those fish. Um, but generally I will use birds, uh, to, to, especially the ones that are flying overhead and I see them kind of look at something, I'll, I'll use those to assess shorelines quickly. And if I don't see them stop, I see them kind of glaze over an area with, you know, no attention given to anything else. I generally will, you know, very quickly fish that area. Sometimes I'll even skip right over it if I'm not seeing bait jumping around or some other presence uh, of life in that area. So, uh, one more little secret I wanted to share when looking for trout, um, sure you've seen this as well but looking for areas on the surface of the water that look like they're slicked out it almost looks like a an oil slick if trout are feeding heavily on bait fish what they do is sometimes they'll regurgitate those bait fish and those oils will get released into the water 
and it will almost look like a calm spot. You know, you'll see ripples on the surface of the water and then you'll see like a circle of like a calm area and that's the oil coming up to the surface. I yeah. saw one yesterday and I took a picture of it because I, I know people ask about this all the time. You can see that right there is the slick and it continues out over here. But that you, you can see where the water is different. That's a slick right there. And I see a lot of people that ask questions about, you know, what does a slick look like? That's what it looks like. Now, the thing about slicks to keep in mind is that it tells you where fish were feeding. And those, those slicks will continue to drift. So if you see one pop up, try to get over there as quick as possible. Because that, what that's telling you is those fish have already eaten something and they're now regurgitating it. Uh, and if that slick is large and you've seen it carry over to you, those fish aren't still under that slick. They're where the slick started. So you, when, you, when you are targeting slicks, it's important to hop on over to it as quick as you can. Um, you'll see it pop up and generally when it's still that small circle, that's when it's best. That was a slick that did not have trout under it. It had drifted over to me, but I continued and I followed up. Luckily, I was able to get on some of those fish but it does not tell you right where fish are feeding. It tells you where they were um, as, as you kind of keep track of where that, that slick came from. So try don't start fishing the end of a slick if you kind of pull up to it, continue through it. And if you can get to the start of where it was, that's where you're generally going to have the most activity. Yeah, you got to factor in, you know, the current, which way is the current moving, which way is the wind blowing. And then you want to, you know, just like you said, that slick is going to be, from the fish that are up current from it or upwind from it. So uh, yeah, keep that in mind. And the, the reason trout do that, you know, they overindulge. <laughs> I'm sure you've seen a trout with like an 18, I've caught an 18 inch trout with a 10 inch mullet in its stomach. And, you know, they, they just eat too much. And when that happens, they start regurgitating what they're, what they just ate because it's just too much for them to eat. Yeah, it's, it's, they've 100% got eyes that are too big for their stomach. And, that, and that's one last thing I'd, I'd like to touch on. I know we're kind of getting into some bonus tips here is try to put an eye on any bait that you're working. You know, when I've got my paddle tails, I generally try to use jig heads that have the large eyes. I strike as one of our favorite jig heads here at Salt Strong. We're not sponsored by them or anything, but the reason they work so well, I don't have any in front of me. I'm probably out, honestly, because I use them so much. But you can see that there's not really an eye on this. But if you look at, you know, this Paul Brown, these oversized eyes, this is, you know, regarded as one of the best trout baits out there. And a lot of that success has been attributed to the, these oversized eyes because it gives trout something to, to strike on. Uh, it gives them kind of that profile. The eye is what allows them to really know where, yep, just like that. That is one of my favorite jig heads for clear water, especially the red jig head. It just, you know, just a little kind of, fleck of red, especially in shallow water. I don't find that it works really well in dirty water uh, just because that red dissipates uh, really, really quickly um, in the water column. But, you know, having, and again, with the mirror lures as well, big red eyes. Eyes are one of the biggest things for trout. Again, we've talked so much about how they're visual predators. Really, really important that you give them something to strike. Predators generally will strike the eye. Trout will wound things first and then they will go eat them head first. So uh, if you look at, you know, all the, the mullet that are caught on live bait, um, people that fish with croakers, those fish almost always hit those, those baits head first and the tail sticking out of their mouth. There's pictures of, you know, big trout that have red fish. You can see the spot on those tails sticking out of their mouth. Trout love to eat things head first once they've wounded them, uh, you know, uh, things like that. Uh, and I find that having a larger eye on your baits, if you can, choose a bait that's got oversized eyes, things like that. I find that those work really well and they get a lot of strikes just because it gives those predators something to dial in on. Um, and that's, you know, one of my favorite things to have as a visual aspect on my bait is an oversized eye uh, and something that gives them a target to hit. Good stuff. I think yeah. that pretty much wraps it up. Yeah, I would say so. We've covered so much in this podcast about spring trout. Now, a lot of these tactics will kind of transfer over into other seasons as well. There's a lot of things that we've covered in this podcast that are not just spring specific, but there are a couple tips that are really going to help you have a little bit more success in the spring um, just because they're really kind of seasonal specific stuff, like just kind of focusing on bait, things like that. 
But if you guys have any other questions, uh, we've got a blog post for this podcast and we will answer those questions if you go to saltstrong.com and you go and leave a comment under this podcast. And, and you know, if you would like some help kind of learning how to pick the right spots on satellite maps, or maybe you don't know how to navigate those things, or you would like to see all these practices in place in a live setting, me and Tony go out on the water every single week and we publish insider reports where we show you what retrieves we're using, what baits we're using, the types of areas that we're fishing. We even show you exactly where we're fishing on satellite maps and we've got our GoPros on our heads. You can see the whole spectrum of it and we kind of break down every trip so that we can help you guys become better anglers. And you can get all that at saltstrong.com if you join the insider club, which you know I think comes out to what, 27 cents per day or something like that with the pro membership. It's like, how much tackle have I spent or how much money have I spent on these top waters? These are, you know, $10, $11 a piece. If I was to hold off on buying one top water a month, I could afford the Insider Club. And it would really help me catch a lot more fish than just buying a single top water because I could be fishing it in the wrong area. I could be fishing it too fast, too slow. And all the trends that we've talked about, we kind of keep you guys in tune with what's going on uh, in your area each week, basically, you know, if we've had a cold front push through, we'll go through the different retrieves, things like that. And it really helps you keep in tune with what's going on. If you're not able to get out on the water every week or maybe even, you know, every month, keeps you in tune with what's happening. Yep. And you also have, you know, direct access to us through our community. You know, we have a private community on there. It's a private, it's almost like Facebook, but it's ours. You know, we control it. We control what's on there. It's clean, no snook candy, none of that on there. So if you have, if you're one of our members, you have any questions, you just post it on there. You'll get a lot of helpful, you know, responses from the members themselves as well as us. So you got a little VIP access there. Oh yeah, absolutely. And on top of all that, you know, a lot of the lures we've talked about, especially Slam Shady Paddle Tail that works really well for trout. We've got them in our shop at 20% off for Salt Strong Insiders. So again, you're not only saving money because you're not having to buy as much tackle, you are going to save money on the tackle that you are gonna get because you get 20% off in the shop. So it just really makes sense to join the Insider Club. You're gonna learn how to catch fish better. You're gonna save money on your tackle and you're gonna keep in tune with what the current trends are. So you're gonna save time and money. If you haven't joined the Insider Club, I don't know what you guys are waiting on. It's really gonna help you become a better angler. But Tony, I think we've wrapped up everything there is to share on speckled trout in the spring. Thank you so much for coming on guys and we'll see you on the next one. Take it easy.